In June 1981, the trial for the kidnapping of Timothy White would begin in Hayward, California. Seemingly a simple case to prosecute, there would be many unexpected twists. The case itself would highlight unnerving questions about consent and the treatment of victims. Once again, Stephen Stainer would come to the defense of Timothy White and testify against the man he once considered a father who had held and abused him for seven years. His testimony and character would be attacked by the defense in an effort to discredit him as a witness, a tactic he will face again in the next trial. In the end, even a last-minute defense on the part of kidnapper Kenneth Parnell won't keep him out of jail. Join us for this episode in our series, The Life and Kidnapping of Stephen Stainer, The First Trial of Kenneth Parnell. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. I'm Jessica, and with me are Charles and Sean. How are you guys doing? I'm doing good. I got a cavity filled today. Oh, but you're you're feeling better? Yeah, the side of my face is gone, but it's fine. I'm also doing good. I didn't have a cavity filled. I consumed a lot of sugar today, mm. so I'm very excited. So last episode, we talked about the legal issues during arraignment and preliminary hearings. This episode, we'll talk about the first trial Parnell will go through, and that's the trial for the crime of kidnapping Timothy White. Before we get started, I just want to clear up a mistake from last episode. It's just a little mistake. I said that uh, when Sean Poorman goes to jail, he's put in a, a group home in Redwood City. It's actually in Red Bluff. So after all the issues with arraignments and preliminary hearings, when the trials are actually scheduled in 1981, the trial for the kidnapping of Stephen Stainer is actually scheduled first. But because of the legal questions regarding whether or not Stephen was kidnapped or if the statute of limitations had passed, those take so long to go through appeals. That trial is put on hold and the trial for Timothy White for his kidnapping gets started sooner. And it starts in June 1981. And I'm just going to mention that here because this tiny detail will actually affect how Parnell is sentenced when everything is said and done. So just kind of remember it for when we get there. And one of the first things that happens in both trials is that they get moved from Merced and Ukiah to Alameda County. And just a quick explanation of how this works in California. If a judge grants a request to move a trial, then they ask for help from a branch of California government known as the Administrative Office of the Courts. It's a branch under the Judicial Council of California. The people at the AOC get an explanation from the judge detailing why a change of venue is needed. So in this case, there's been so much press that they want to move it so they can find a jury that doesn't, hasn't heard as much about Parnell. This explanation will help guide their search for an alternative location. They coordinate with other counties around the state, looking at their trial loads and to find judges with schedules open and available space for accommodating the trial. They put together all this information, and in this case, then offer Mendocino County and Merced County, three or four alternate counties the trials could be moved to. All the attorneys and the judge get together and pick a place best suited to their needs. This is another reason why both these trials will cost a lot of money. When a trial is moved to another county, the original county is expected to cover all the costs. Trial costs holding Parnell because they'll have to move him to an Alameda County jail. Uh, the attorneys travel. Those are just examples. And for instance, Scott Lestrange, he's Parnell's attorney, and he's a public defender in Mendocino County. He will now have to travel often to Alameda County for trial, to get ready for trial, to talk with Parnell, and even stay nights. So this will also make him unavailable for other duties he has as a public defender in Mendocino, and they have to actually hire someone entirely different to take his place during this trial. When it's just the counties, is there any like state or federal money that is helpful that they could help out? The biggest problem at this time, and I, I need to find out if it's changed, but I know it's a big issue here, is that the state will help out. And it did help out in 1980, not with this case, but it will help out in 1980. The problem is it only typically helps out in cases of murder. Oh. So this is a kidnapping. And actually in Mendocino County, there's some, a couple of big cases that have been moved locations. There's a big fraud case where they have to fly people in from all over the world. And it costs a lot of money, but it's not a murder trial. So the state won't give them any hmm. help. So they're going to work to try and after this trial to change that because they're just a small county and they don't have as much money. 
which I wonder in a larger sense would then affect the local DA in what cases they go after, knowing those bigger cases, if it's not necessarily a capital offense, how they deal with them because of the monetary or the monetary burden involved in that. Yeah, I don't know how often it affects a DA's actual decision-making process, but I do think when we're thinking about this, smaller counties are at a disadvantage, and you don't want that when you're talking about both getting justice and also holding people accountable. But I do know Lestrange and both the DA have to go back to the county several times during this trial to ask for more money, and that puts a lot of pressure on the county. And there are little things, things I never think about. Lestrange at one point thinks Parnell might plead innocent by reason of insanity. So he asks for money from the county for a psychological evaluation. And he needs, uh, the defense needs their own investigator. So all of that costs a lot of money. The trials are moved to Alameda County. Alameda is the seventh largest county in California. Oakland is its biggest city and it's part of the Bay Area. The reasons the trial is moved here are one, is how large Alameda County is. In 1980, the population of all of Mendocino County is 66,738 people, and this would represent the jury pool from which to choose from. Merced County is a bit bigger, but still relatively small comparatively. It had 134,557 people living there who were prospective jurors. Alameda County in 1980 had 1.15 million people living there. The other reason is that Alameda County has courtrooms more capable of handling the interests of the press in this case. This is something that's looked at when deciding where a trial will be moved, and there is obviously lots of interest in this case. Kenneth Parnell's trial in the kidnapping of Timothy White begins on June 8, 1981, 13 months after Timothy White and Stephen Stainer escaped in Ukiah. He is charged with a single count of kidnapping. So after all of that, all the preliminary, the, the arraignment, it's now bargained down to one single count of kidnapping for Timothy. It's what he's initially charged with when right. it comes to Timothy, and it is the most serious charge. I think the problem for me is it's hard to separate what Kenneth Parnell did to Timothy from what he did to Stephen. Even right. though those, I know it's not the same, but we know Kenneth is a, an evil person and all of the hell that Stephen endured. Even on this case, to hear that he was only charged with one count. I know, it seems like a much bigger crime than that, but that's the law as it is. That's pretty much the law now. I mean, he kidnaps Timothy White, and they have to go with what they can prove, and they are choosing to go with the the bigger offense here with the most time. The more serious. Right. I think it's also good to point out because that this is a, almost a year after. Right. That all of the stuff that we've talked about is really encapsulated in one year. It's amazing. All of the, the, the turmoil that the families have went through, the news media outlets, the, the court proceedings, the investigation, and it's really just a year. The trial will take place in Hayward Superior Court at the Hayward Hall of Justice, and it was built in 1975. So it's a modern court equipped with everything needed for the press. It's also a big deal because it was part of a movement to get superior courts in other parts of Alameda County, not just in Oakland. Hayward is about 19 miles from Oakland, California, and 134 miles from Ukiah. The judge in the case is Judge M.O. Sabra. M.O. stands for Modeste Orton, and he goes by M.O. His parents called him Mo, but we're not his parents. He's originally from Canada and used to be a district attorney. The paper notes he is a very respected judge and known for dealing with legally complicated cases and cases that involve the press. So this is literally the perfect case or the perfect judge for this case. Before jury selection begins, the judge makes a decision on allowing the press into the courtroom. The press will be allowed, but when it comes to cameras, only one TV camera will be allowed, and one still photographer who is allowed two cameras and two lenses. There will also be one audio system, and reporters can use pocket-sized devices. The TV reporting camera, is Uh. that, is there like negotiations on that, or is it just a a certain camera and all the TV uh, news uses that feed. It doesn't say specifically in the newspapers, but I think that's what's happening here. It's because there's not a lot of disagreement about it. And he sets down the rules 
quickly. Okay. So he definitely seems to know what he's doing here. But I think it is something where they, they get the feed and then they request parts of it or whatever they need. So probably the same thing for the still photogra- photography as well. We're taking pictures. Like you see the court the court artists, you know, and then everybody gets a chance to, to look through those and use them for their own purposes. Yeah, I believe so. Parnell is brought in wearing a white prison jumpsuit. He's been moved to Alameda County Jail. I think this jail is now called the Glenn Dyer Detention Facility, and it's in Oakland, California, and it actually just closed as of June of this year due to cost issues. Parnell hasn't had any problems in this jail. He stays in a cell with 18 other men and is the tank trustee. A trustee is someone in jail who often isn't there for serious offenses, and he's able to get responsibilities in the running of the jail, and the tank refers to the type of holding cell that he's in. So Kenneth is a trusted prisoner in this in this instance? Yeah, and he hasn't, I don't know exactly when he gets moved, but it would be nearer to when they go on trial. So I, I don't know how long he's been there or why in particular Kenneth Parnell, but... But long enough that the prison says, this, is, this person is somebody we can trust. Yes. Wow. The judge will move Parnell from Alameda County Jail to a closer jail in Santa Rita. Santa Rita Jail is in Dublin, California, and is a bigger facility than the Alameda County Jail. In 1980, when Parnell is there, the jail is on a World War II training base, and the jail was actually constructed in 1947. Just a few years later, in 1983, the jail will be rebuilt on 113 acres because of overcrowding issues. It's a really large jail. And the reason I'm bringing this up is this creates a couple issues, specifically for Scott Lestrange, Parnell's attorney. One, the Alameda County Jail is much closer and easier for him to get to from Ukiah, the one that's in Oakland, and he needs to see Parnell to plan for trial, to go over things with him. Traveling from Mendocino, you go south to get to Oakland, and that's already a two-hour drive, assuming you don't hit a lot of traffic. Dublin is even further south, adding on a good day 20 to 30 minutes onto his travel. On top of which, once at Santa Rina Jail, he will receive some death threats. His lawyers blame an article that comes out in the Oakland Tribune East Bay today that says that Parnell is being charged with molestation charges against Timothy White. The paper quickly corrects itself, but Lestrange says this makes people in jail angry. And when Parnell goes to Santa Rina Jail, he's already in protective custody, so the judge doesn't seem too concerned, but there are worries that he might be attacked. When trial begins and Parnell is brought in the jumpsuit, the judge makes an order that he get changed and wear regular clothes. This is before a jury is picked, so no one sees him who will be making decisions about the trial, but the judge deals with it right away. Parnell will not claim insanity and will also not claim diminished capacity. I don't know what came from his being interviewed by the psychiatrist. Those documents are not shared with us. And diminished capacity is not a defense allowed in a kidnapping trial. It takes a week, but a jury is finally agreed upon. It consists of seven men and five women. During the trial, the prosecution would like very much not to have to put Timothy White on the stand. The DA will be relying on Stephen Stainer's testimony, as well as Sean Poorman. But just in case they do need Timothy to testify, he's brought into the courtroom one day and shown around. It's explained to him what he's going to do. He, they show him where things will happen. He's get, he gets a chance to sit in the witness box and ask to raise his right hand. He raises his left, and someone in the court audience yells out, quote, your other right hand. Which raises my first concern, because I didn't expect them to be doing this with people in the courtroom. I guess I've seen too much TV or something. I thought, he's a little kid. And he actually does this while Parnell is in the courtroom. Wow. I was thinking it could have just been, like, the bailiff or something like that. But with Parnell actually in there, that's just like, I I don't know. Maybe it could be that some of the things that we take for granted now that would happen when a child testifies... Um, these guys aren't, they're not even thinking about it. It's not on their radar yet. Yeah. The whole victim's rights thing hasn't been put into law yet at this time. But the other thing is, I think there might be things I don't even think about. These are people coming from Ukiah. They may only have that day to do it. And there are other things the court has to get done. So it might be a scheduling issue. I'm not really sure. It's already costing an, an exorbitant amount of money. So you have to get your testimony where you can. On June 18th, 1981, opening arguments begin in the trial. Parnell's lawyer, Scott Lestrange, waives his right to an opening statement. Basically, he holds on to this right and will make his opening statement after the prosecution rests. The main reason for this is that he doesn't want to give the prosecution a heads up on what he has planned as a defense. Kenneth Parnell sat at the defense table throughout the trial. He was wearing a blue and white jacket, was wearing glasses, 
described as bald and had lost about 30 pounds since his arrest. He really almost looks like a different person, and he's also grown a mustache. So what you described, he has this new look of 30 pounds lighter and a mustache. Do you think this has, is this part of the defense? Does it make him look better in front of a jury? I don't know if it, how it helps him with that. It could. He does look better than he did when he was arrested. He looks really different. And we'll make sure to put a picture up so everyone can see on our social media. But I can tell you that one thing I haven't included in here is that throughout this year, he's constantly uh, writing writs to the court saying that he's having health problems. And one of them is a gastrointestinal issue. So, I mean, it could have something to do with that. Um, he's tried to get out of jail because of it. So I don't know exactly what's going on. We also do know he's very manipulative. So it might be something in his head. He's trying to work the system for his own benefit. The motive for the crime given by the prosecution was building a family. And this is also what the defense says. And this is something that I think is going to irritate us um, because it's obviously not the motive for the crime. But it becomes an issue of what the prosecution can prove versus reality. So Parnell can say that there's nothing disproving it. Is that what you're saying? Right. They have witnesses who talk with Parnell before Timothy White was kidnapped, who say he told them he was looking to adopt another child to to make his family bigger and because he needed help at home. Even Stephen tells that to the police at one point. So they have actual proof of that motive. They don't have a lot of proof to back up a claim that he was... The sexual abuse. Right. And we know that that's actually what was going to happen, but... Parnell is laying this groundwork of, I'm looking to adopt a new child. I want to. I want to increase my family. Every everybody listening to this and any thinking rational person knows he's doing it because he's going to. He wants a kid for sexual to to, to sexually abuse this child. Right. But that lie is laying the groundwork for his defense. Is Stephen's testimony because Stephen will test testify in this? Is he allowed to talk about? sexual abuse at all in no time. not okay. at all so it's still it sucks that this is what the prosecution is saying is building a family when everyone knows right. even the prosecution because they know steven's story but it's just horrible that that's all they can get and he's not allowed to bring up the sexual abuse because He's not allowed, he, when he testifies, and we'll go over that, he is allowed to say that he was kidnapped himself, but that's it. He can't go into details about his life or any of that stuff. They feel it will be too prejudicial. And he hasn't actually been um, found guilty of that crime yet. The court says it would be too prejudicial against Parnell's case. Right. Wow. And I understand um, the difficulty with this. I don't know that even the defense, I mean, the prosecution has to provide a motive. But I think they feel they need to because you're telling the jury the story of what happened. And juries often want to know why. And they can't present something they can't prove. Because isn't this this laying the groundwork and the prosecution saying it's because he wants to start a family? Is this laying the groundwork for Parnell in Stephen's trial then to say, you know, you as a prosecution and said that I was just trying to start a family. And now you're bringing up all the sexual abuse stuff. I, we don't have transcripts from the trial. I don't see that come up during that trial. That trial is more about blaming the victim, really. Okay. So that actually doesn't, the motive is clear, and the prosecution presents witnesses, including psychologists Stephen talks to, to present that motive in trial. Oh, so, okay. So this, this building a family is really just focused on Timothy's case right. and, and right. has nothing to do with Stevens. Right. And it's hard because Timothy wasn't abused. Right. And, it, and that's not to say that it wasn't okay that he was kidnapped or that it wasn't going to happen. It's clear to all of us who are listening that it was. But I think the prosecution is afraid that if they present a motive they can't prove, then the jury might start thinking about all of the evidence they present as maybe being false. And then he might eventually go free. Better convict him of the crime you know he did than try to convict him of a crime you're pretty sure he would have committed. Right. The first witness to be called was Angie White. She described the differences in Timothy's appearance when he was found, particularly the color of his hair. This is important because the prosecutor wants to submit as evidence a box of nice and easy that Parnell used to dye Timothy's hair. Timothy is also brought into the courtroom during her questioning so that she can identify him. And he stands inches from Parnell when this happens. Randall Sean Porman, or Sean Porman as we've been calling him, will also testify. 
Parman has pled guilty to helping Parnell and convicted of misdemeanors in that case. If you'll recall, the court has mandated him to a home in Red Bluff, a group home where he attends school for behavior problems. At the beginning of trial, his lawyer was going to have him plead the fifth when asked questions because he wasn't given immunity from his crimes, but the DA does give him immunity, so he testifies to the things Parnell offered him in exchange for his help. He also testified to all the things that happened the day that he and Parnell kidnapped Timothy White. Next, Stephen Stainer also testifies. His testimony lasts two days. His testimony covers most of what we already told you in previous episodes. He's not allowed to talk in depth about his own kidnapping, as we said, because a judge doesn't want to prejudice the jury. He talks in depth about going to Santa Rosa a few months before Parnell kidnapped Timothy. Parnell took Stephen to Coddington Shopping Center in Santa Rosa to, quote, get someone else to take home. There he asked Stephen to get two separate kids. Stephen walked up and talked to the children, then went back to Parnell and told him the children's mothers were there. The importance is that this establishes a pattern of Parnell trying to kidnap children and just a short time before Timothy is taken. Stevens also asked to describe how he knew Timothy had been taken. He had never, if you remember, he had never seen Timothy before when Parnell picks him up from school. Timothy was just in the back seat. And Stevens not really allowed to talk about on the stand his own kidnapping. It's kind of a conceit that the judge and the jury knows that that's something coming up. So Stephen says that it was because of his own situation that he kind of put two and two together. But that's really all he says about that. He was asked to draw a diagram of the cabin and testified that while there, Timothy slept on the couch or a recliner. He also testified that he was not aware of the manhunt for Timothy. He described each attempt to take Timothy home. The first time they were gone for the cabin for almost two hours and 10 cars passed them by, no one pulled over. During the second attempt, it was about the same. The third time it was rainy and they had to go back. And the fourth time, as we know, a man finally did pull over. He also talks about how, and this is the first time I had heard this, that Timothy didn't want to hitchhike into Ukiah. He wanted to walk the entire way because he was afraid of getting into cars with other people. Which is probably, I mean, this is sort of when strange danger is happening, but also, I mean, he's just been kidnapped, so. Stephen was also asked to identify some blankets from the cabin and a box of Nightall sleeping tablets. There were also some differences between Stephen's and Sean Porman's testimony. Porman told the court that he talked about Timothy with Stephen and that the two had talked about the reward of $15,000. Stephen insisted that he never talked to anyone and knew nothing about the reward. And I think this is an effort by the defense to try and discredit both of these witnesses. So saying that Stephen's only doing this for the money? Right. Yeah, that comes up. And I mean, I don't know who's actually telling the truth here. It's a pretty big difference. Um, I do know Poorman had initially told some not totally truths when he was first arrested. So, I mean, I don't know that it matters. It might just be, I mean, Sean Poorman's now what age at this time during this? I think he's 16, 15, 16. He's still young and maybe he's just, he's trying to find his his own way of making himself feel better that, you know, I told someone, yeah, I'm not all horrible because he's, you know, he's young and everyone's looking at him. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. And there's a lot happening here for both boys and in particular, Stephen. He's quoted as saying that the idea of testifying against Parnell makes him feel, quote, sick In court, he looks at Parnell several times, and the paper describes him as moving his chair around a lot as he answers questions and just acting very nervous, which I think is a really normal thing to be feeling here. He's This is probably one of the, other than the preliminary trial, one of the first times he's in the same room with Parnell. This is almost a year after he's been trying to put some semblance of life back together. He's coming to terms with what happened to him. He's trying to reforge a connection with his family and now to be thrust back into it and not just, I mean, I know what he's been, I don't know what he's been going through, but that all the stuff that's come out in the papers, but this is different. This is the person that's victimized you for seven years is sitting a few feet away from you. And all those new thoughts of learning how all those things were lies right. and and it's just been brewing for a year now he's thinking about it this is the first time he sees it no one you i i know i do like sometimes when i think about how a conversation might go and i might get angry and then when i actually get put into that conversation by the first sentence with that person it's not how i 
planned it out. So you just have all these thoughts. You never know what's going to happen. You don't know how you're going to act. And it's probably just a lot. On top of which, he's not allowed to speak about how he was a victim. He's, he. I mean, he, we've talked about gag orders before, but he actually has a gag order on him that you're not able to speak out in public about what, what this person's done to you and how it's affected you and ruined your life. With all that said, it it, it kind of goes against the term fair trial because, I mean, it seems like it's a fair trial for the defense, but not for Stephen because he doesn't get to tell the truths at all that of what actually went on. So it doesn't seem very fair. Yeah, it's hard because it's limited. And I think, you know, the Constitution, the fair trial is for the person who they're going to theoretically put in jail. But I have to think... We know, and the DA says he doesn't want to have Timothy be put on the stand, and so that's a lot of pressure, too. You know this case sort of rests on him and really Sean Poorman, and that's I can't imagine that pressure, feeling like you have to come through and— Two kids. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have one who's who's admitted to wrongdoing, right or wrong, Poorman. I won't say he's at, he's not, the, he's not a, the same type of victim as Stephen or Timothy, but— you know, there's a certain amount of, of victimization going on. Stephen, who's 14, and everything rests on these two young men's shoulders who are already dealing with a bunch of complicated stuff on their own. So, that, yeah, that pressure must be. And I have to agree with you. It does feel, and it will get even worse for his trial, that he's the one who is on trial, not Parnell. And this is before the California's Victims Bill of Rights is added to the penal code. And that's done in 2008. And that will give actual rights to victims, both in courtrooms and outside with police. But none of that exists here. And that's not to say that the police or the DA don't treat him correctly. It's just to say that a lot of those things we've come to understand where you have an advocate who's there for you and who shows you the courtroom, that kind of stuff, who prepares you for what to expect and what to say, doesn't really come along till 2008. Which is not necessarily to say that the, that these the prosecutor, the court, the the police, they may be doing, between 1980 and 2008, these people might be doing some of these things, but it's not required by law. Right. Those rights under the law. And now, now you don't have an option that you are to do what's best for the victim. Yeah. And we will link that law uh, on to our social media so people can see it and read it in case you're going through something like this yourself. you get mad when listening to true crime well so do i if you want a weekly true crime podcast that says what you're thinking then grab a beer and pull up a deck chair this is cambo from true crime island another true crime podcast and maintain the rage with me Visit TrueCrimeIsland.com where you can download or stream each episode. Plus, there's links to iTunes and social media. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. This is True Crime Island. Stephen's testimony also highlights, in my mind, some of the abuse he suffered. There's a section of testimony where he's asked what he was thinking when he saw Timothy, and he says he knew right away what happened, and he didn't interact at all with Timothy for the first couple of days. He says, quote, I just didn't want to know who he was. And I think confronting that this person is real and this is happening means confronting his own situation. And after a couple days, according to Stephen, with Parnell at work, Timothy began talking, having little conversations with him, engaging him, and mainly talking about missing his family. And it sounds like that conversation eventually breaks through to Stephen. And of course, as we know, he brings him into Ukiah. The DA also put people on the stand who live near Parnell that testified that they saw Timothy outside, but didn't realize who he was. After the prosecution rests, the defense begins with Scott Lestrange giving his opening statement. In it, there's a surprise defense to everyone in the courtroom. According to Lestrange, someone else committed the kidnapping of Timothy White. Lestrange says that he will present evidence that another man, a man named Hank, actually kidnapped Timothy White to use in a pornography operation that would then be traded to pay for drugs, or dope, as they keep saying. It's a very 1980s term. To present his defense, Kenneth Parnell takes the stand. 
His defense is that he didn't actually kidnap Timothy White, as he said, but this other man named Hank did, and threatened Parnell into hiding the boy for him. According to Parnell, sometime in 1979, a man he knew from the Bay Area who had drug and child pornography convictions came to him and told him he knew that Dennis Parnell was really Stephen Stainer, and that he knew Parnell had kidnapped him. This man threatened to tell the police. About a month later, Hank came to the Palace Hotel and began asking for details about the kidnapping and how Parnell hid Dennis Parnell all these years. Parnell told the court he was in shock and didn't know what to do. He thought about moving again, but they hadn't moved that long ago, and he didn't have the money for it. Hank also threatened Parnell's mother. So at this point, Parnell is admitting to, on the stand that he kidnapped Stephen, and this guy knew about it. Right, it's part of his story. Okay. In January of 1980, Parnell again saw Hank at the Palace Hotel, and it was then that he told Parnell he believed he could snatch a kid and, quote, work it out in his dope deals or whatever. Parnell was against helping Hank because he had been through so much during the years. Unfortunately for Parnell, on February 13th, he got a call from Hank instructing him to pick up Sean Poorman and take him to Ukiah. Parnell tried to protest because he had prior plans. He had bought a mattress and needed to pick it up. He testified that he had a receipt. I don't know if the receipt is entered into evidence, but he bought the mattress on a different day than he is going to go pick it up. So he's saying, I can't help you kidnap a child because I have to pick up a mattress I bought. Yes, that's what he tells the court. And in the paper, it says that Parnell testified that he had been looking for a mattress for a long time. And so he's finally found one. So it, he needs to pick it up. This mattress is important. Yes. I actually don't know what to say at that. On the night of the 13th, Parnell says that he drove Porman into Ukiah as told. Parnell saw Porman hanging around the hotel during the time that he was there working. Turns out Porman is the stepson of this Hank person that Parnell's been talking about. And at 6 a.m. on the 14th, Parnell testified that he asked Porman to go down to pick up some pastry and also to pick up some newspapers for him. At 8 a.m., Parnell will say he didn't see Porman around the hotel any longer. When Parnell got off his shift at 8 a.m., he went to the Samoa bar for a beer. He had a couple of beers and then looked around for Porman. He didn't see him, and he went at 10 a.m. to pick up his mattress. He picked up his mattress from a thrift shop and talked with the owner and his wife while he tied it down to the car. He then started home, and he stopped at a restaurant called El Robozo, which is a Mexican restaurant, or it was a Mexican restaurant, at 1801 South State Street. I don't think it's actually there anymore, but it was opened in 1976 and run by the Vera family. So, this mattress, sorry, it's this very important mattress was actually just at a thrift shop? Yes, that's where he found it. I think partially because mattresses, even at this time, are expensive. Okay. So he's been looking for something he can't sleep at night, is what he says on the stand. So he's been looking for a while for something that's in his price range and comfortable. Okay. And he finally finds it. All right. And he's saying all this in open... I mean, this is this is under oath. He's saying this in open court. It's his... Yeah, it does seem like he did actually purchase a mattress, and it does get to the Manchester cabin at some point. When that happens is really the question here. So... In that way, he's not lying. Is but there any pictures of the mattress? I haven't seen any okay. photos or in the newspaper or anything. So in an article in the Ukiah Daily Journal, just to give you some little information about this restaurant, it says the family came from Mexico and started it. The chef is Mr. Vera's mother-in-law, and they also opened a tortilla factory in Ukiah so they could supply their restaurant with fresh tortillas daily, but they also sold them, which I was excited. I think every town should have that. Parnell tells the jury that he ate at El Barbozo about once a month. On the day Timothy was kidnapped, he testified he stopped there at 11 a.m. and wanted to sit at a table he liked in front of a window but right next to the bathroom. This was his preference because of all the coffee and then beers he drank before going home. Unfortunately, there were two women and two girls sitting there, so he sat somewhere else. And I think all of these little details are to prove to the jury that he was actually there. Right. After eating, he went home. He got to the cabin in Manchester at 1.30 p.m., unloaded the mattress, and had some coffee and a couple of cigarettes. At 2 p.m., Sean Porman showed up at the cabin. Parnell did not see how he got there. Porman told Parnell, quote, we took a kid. Parnell asked Porman, quote, what do you mean? To which Porman replied, 
We kidnapped someone. I'm going over to my girlfriend's for a party. Scott Lestrange asked Parnell what he felt when Porman told him he had kidnapped a child with Hank. Parnell replied, quote, I was glad I wasn't a part of it, doing anything like that, and I hoped I wouldn't have any more to do with it. Two days later, on the 16th of February, Parnell went to the Palace Hotel to get his paycheck. While there, Hank showed up and told him he was having difficulties and needed a place to keep the child. Parnell told him he did not want any part of it, but Hank threatened him and told him he was already a part of it. Parnell claimed in his testimony he would, quote, call the police on me or do something to Steve. He was afraid he would turn him in. Five days after Timothy's kidnapping, Parnell testified Hank showed up at his place with Timothy and forced him to hide the child. He also brought with him boxes of clothes, toys, and a box of hair dye. As it turns out, this Hank person is a real person. He's a 27-year-old man named Henry Medier Jr., and he had been in the courtroom a couple of days prior to Parnell's testimony. And according to him, it was the first time he had ever actually seen Parnell. Medier does have a connection to Sean Porman. Medier had been in a relationship with Porman's mother and refers to Porman as his stepson. Medier is now married to someone else with his own child, but during the nine years he was with Porman's mother, he came to care for Sean and his siblings. So after Sean Porman is arrested for helping Parnell, Medier was there to help Sean with all the legal issues, and I think probably actually helps him get a lawyer. This is a quote from the San Francisco Examiner from Medier. Quote, there was nobody else to go to bat for Sean in this whole mess. We're close. I help him all I can. He can clean in his testimony 100%, and it did him a lot of good. He lied the first time because he was scared, but this time what he said was true. So Medier had gone to court to support Sean Porman when he's testifying. It's someone he knows well, and he says he's surprised to hear these accusations. Now, when it comes to Porman's testimony, does it... Does he back up Parnell or does he back up Medier? So by the time that Parnell goes on the stand, he's doing it in his own defense. So Porman has already testified and he backs up, um, well, not Medier necessarily, but he, he doesn't know this is a surprise defense, but he backs up Steven Stainer and, the, and what Timothy White says about the kidnapping. Okay. The, the truth. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, in this case, it's the truth. This is, a, I mean... There's a lot. There's a lot to unpack from that story too. I mean, uh, when Parnell goes on to talk about Hank showing up with Timothy and saying, "Well, I, I'm just glad I wasn't a part of it." Yeah. Yet at the same time, he's already admitted throughout the story that he has in fact kidnapped another child. You're talking about Steven Steiner. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pretty crazy story, and it comes out of nowhere because if you remember uh lestrange parnell's attorney doesn't actually give an opening statement so nobody has any idea what his defense is going to be until he's put on the stand do you think that this defense was well it probably it's not a shock to his defense attorney right well right i guess the first time is because the uh lestrange gives his opening statement right before he puts parnell on the stand and kind of clues everybody in and then they put parnell on the stand so yeah no it's a, it's something they've planned They've discussed. Discussed. At the same time, it's it's terrible that this kind of accusation was put against somebody like Medier because it seems like he's genuinely a good guy. Even though he's not with Sean Porman's um, mom anymore, he he still thinks of him as a stepson and looks out for him and helps him out. And in a in a time when it would have been very easy for everybody to kind of turn their back on Sean, he doesn't. He actually stands up for him. Right, and I I don't know. They don't. Parnell never uses his last name. Hank is not the name he normally goes by. That's something I think his dad is the only one who calls him that. He goes by Henry. But okay. um, and he never says Parnell never says Medier as a last name. But because he says uh, Sean Porman's stepdad, that kind of it kind of clues us into who that is. But I believe uh, Medier comes forward first. And I don't know if they don't expect someone to come forward and say, "Hey, he's talking about me. I didn't do that," because it would be kind of easy to just ignore it. You know, I don't want to be a part of it. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I don't want to get involved. Well, I mean, even having someone just accuse you of these things, even Parnell, that can be something that sticks with you. So for him to come right. forward and, and be willing to testify what he's going to do is a pretty big deal. Well, too, it, it goes back to a little bit what we've talked about before, the idea that, I mean, there's, there is some evidence, but the evidence really is predicated on the testimony of three kids. 
of varying ages. Because, I mean, P- Porman at this time is... Well, and only two have testified. Right. And at this time, Porman is 18? No, he's yeah. not quite 18. Not quite. I think 16 or so. Both in the range of 15, 16. And, and Stephen is 14. Timothy... Well, he's 15 by this time, but yeah. 15. So, and then Timothy's obviously a lot younger. So, and we've we've talked about how it's possible that adults right or wrong have a tendency sometimes to not believe kids so i can see a a a juror sitting in there listening to this and maybe being not sympathetic but starting to think about well what happens if that is true hank then backing up his son and saying no no no. what what my son told what my stepson told you is correct he he didn't lie that's 100 percent accurate right and it it was a little surprising to me because the story just comes for us, we know Parnell did this, so it comes to sort of out of nowhere. And also because I can't imagine being Hank Medier isn't in court this day. So you're just somewhere living your life and someone in a courtroom is saying you actually kidnapped somebody. That was just a crazy defense to me. I can't even imagine going through that. It's like something on a TV show, you know, like the dramatic reveal of I didn't do this, but somebody else did. Yeah, and, and I'm not even sure you could do this today. I didn't actually look that up for legal stuff because when we covered the Pinion Pines case, the defense in that case had two people it wanted to use as a defense that, no, these two people did it, but the judge wouldn't let them for a lack of proof. So I'm hoping this isn't still something you could find, your, a situation you'd find yourself in. So you're not bringing up just her, um, not heresy, sorry, that was the wrong one, uh, hearsay or... Yeah, because you could make up any story. It right. could be any Hank in the world because you just made it up. Right, that wasn't the Hank I was talking about. It was another Hank that right. showed up with a kidnapped child <laughs> while I was buying my mattress before and, I and st- eating some Mexican food at, at a reputable right, Mexican but not restaurant. by the window or the bathroom. No, never that. But those are serious charges to say to accuse this person of, of because not only does he accuse him of kidnapping, in his story the person is also a child pornographer. And does deal drug drugs. Loot. Yeah. yeah. I, I wonder if it also speaks to Parnell's level of hubris that he's gotten by practically his all of his adult life with manipulation and lying. And this is another I wonder if this is a, can be seen as another instance of him trying to do that to a courtroom and to a, a jury and say, no, 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 trust me, trust me. This person did it. This other person, I had nothing to do with it. Sure. I, you know, I did kidnap Steven, but yeah, for who knows he could have, he could have pulled the, what's the term pulled the wool over your eyes to the Lestrange. And he b- actually believed this whole story. Yeah. When these accusations are made against Hank Medier, they're very shocking He smartly, quickly involves a lawyer who refers to these accusations as, quote, the most vicious type of lies imaginable. Medier works for his father in San Francisco. His dad is a certified accountant in the Rust Building at 235 Montgomery Street, which is just a detail I mentioned because the Rust Building is a pretty big building. It's important to both San Francisco skyline as well as its architecture. He also wasn't living in Ukiah at the time that Timothy goes missing, but living in Belvedere, California. Belvedere is in Marin County, and it's about two hours from Ukiah. Medier decides to waive immunity and just go ahead and testify for the prosecution in trial. Medier will say he's never even met Parnell, which is interesting because Parnell will say during his testimony that the first time he met Hank was in Elk, California, but that he actually never knew his last name until after he was arrested and his defense attorney told him. On top of Parnell's testimony, the defense also brings in several witnesses to back up Parnell's story about what happened that day. A thrift store employee testified that Parnell had picked up a box spring that Valentine's Day and that he had, as Parnell said, tied it to his car. This witness would say that happened in the morning, but when Porman had testified, he said that they were together the entire time and that there was never a mattress. Also, a bartender at the Samoa Bar testifies that Parnell was in the bar that Valentine's morning, and another witness testified that she saw both Parnell and Stephen doing laundry at a campground that day. Stephen denies he went and did laundry with Parnell and also testifies that Timothy was never left alone at the cabin which he would have had to have been, this woman didn't see any other kids with them, so he would have had to have been left there for them to go and do laundry. After the defense gives their case, the prosecution is allowed to rebut it. Henry Medellar does testify. He says he's never seen Parnell before the trial and denied any role in the kidnapping. 
He does not go by Hank, as we said. In fact, only his father uses that name. And at the time Timothy was kidnapped, Medier was in Mills Valley for a doctor's appointment. Mills Valley is also about two hours from Ukiah. After his testimony, the prosecution calls Stephen back to the stand, and he testified he'd never met Medier either. So the biggest thing that Parnell's defense changes in this trial is up to now Timothy White hasn't had to testify. And if you remember, we said that the, def- that the prosecution doesn't want to have to put him on the stand. But because this defense is all about Timothy being with another man, he actually has to testify. Timothy could barely see over the witness stand and mainly only answered yes or no to questions about the time he was with Parnell. Lestrange stood in front of Parnell blocking Timothy's view of him. Timothy testified that he had never seen Medier and that he was at the cabin the entire time he had been taken. Timothy is never asked to identify his kidnapper directly because as it turns out, he actually saw Parnell at the police station the night that he escaped and he saw him under arrest. So if they ask that directly, Timothy's testimony can be thrown out. And Timothy is described in the newspaper as almost adorable. In the picture in the paper of him, he has a smile across his face, and we'll put it up because he really does barely, his head barely is over the, the witness box. And he is answering questions. People in the courtroom are smiling and even laughing at the way he's responding. And this isn't to tell you that testifying against your kidnapper is fun, but he's a little guy, and this might have an effect on jurors. It definitely has an effect on the entire courtroom. And this is a quote from the San Francisco Examiner. Quote, as Timmy settled in, Parnell seemed to slump. Before Timmy uttered a word of testimony, his con-wise alleged kidnapper must have felt that, barring some last-minute miracle, the child would testify him into the penitentiary. And this is just a way of seeing how big of an impact this particular witness that Timothy will have, because he is, he's little, people can see that and they identify with that. On top of which, every time we've talked about Timothy, he seems... I mean, he's a little kid, but he has an excellent memory for things. He says, I want to say, I guess he's very forthright and speaks what he means. And that comes across a lot of times. He keeps correcting people when, they, when they've when they said something wrong that he said originally. So I can imagine hearing that kind of testimony from a little, from on top of which he's a little, a little kid, you know, and people will be more sympathetic to that, that that would have a huge impact. It's also a good way you can see how the press, their coverage of this is a little bit different than, say, a transcript, because they can see the way people are reacting to Timothy right. or the way, you know, they're giggling or laughing or it's just a whole different viewpoint. They're capturing, you're, they're capturing the entire courtroom and not just the facts of what's, what's right. happening. Before the closing arguments, there are some legal issues to wrap up. In a last-ditch effort to undercut Timothy's testimony that he was at the cabin the entire time he was kidnapped, Scott Lestrange wants to call psychiatrists to testify that witnesses who undergo hypnosis, like Timothy did, especially kids, can have their memories affected. The prosecution believes this is unnecessary because Timothy is only, he's only hypnotized a fine poor man, not Parnell, and the judge agrees with them and denies the request. So for closing arguments, Lestrange says that at most Parnell is guilty of false imprisonment and the prosecution did not prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. The prosecution, on the other hand, says that Parnell couldn't even look at jurors directly. The story he gave was a depiction of fiction. On June 29th, 1981, Parnell was convicted of the kidnapping of Timothy White. The jury took under two hours to find him guilty. The jury says it looked at all the evidence and tried to find something to back up Parnell but that there really wasn't anything there. After the verdict is rendered, the judge has to decide on punishment. And as I understand it, the options for the judge is to give Parnell up to a sentence of the longest seven years. Typically for kidnapping, the years in 1980 are doled out out in anywhere from three to five to seven. He can also add on time up to two years for Parnell's past convictions. So we're saying nine total he could have. Right. Parnell's lawyer, Scott Lestrange, asked the judge for mercy in this case because Timothy White did not suffer a physical injury. The judge says that what he saw in the courtroom was a happy child who appeared to be doing well, but that, quote, we do not know the extent of the fright, fear, and anxiety that this little boy must have suffered. That's kind of an impressive thing, considering a lot of things that we talked about, that he would take into consideration the possible damage that, that Timothy could have suffered because of being frightened. 
and the emotional turmoil, considering we're still we're still quite a few years away from victims' rights really becoming at the forefront of a lot of these cases. Yeah, it just seemed like he had a, a good moral judgment because a lot of the things that we've talked about just seem like no matter what the time is, you think you would hope someone would make better moral judgments. Right. And, and maybe then this he just seemed he he thought it out. Right. Yeah, according to the judge, just because Timothy appears to be doing well, it doesn't negate the harm that Parnell did to him. The judge is not able to take into account the charges against Parnell in the Stainer case. He also does not add time for his prior convictions. In total, he gives Parnell the maximum seven years in jail. However, when it comes to releasing Parnell, he can earn time for good behavior, and he also gets included all the time he's already spent in jail. So during this time, from the first moment he's arrested, all of that counts as time. Which is about, we're talking about almost a year. Yeah, it's about 573 days by this moment. So those days get applied to the sentence. So he's expected to be eligible for release after this verdict in about three and a half years. And that's without good time. It, that's with good time, I believe they can. Oh, okay, that okay. During sentencing, Parnell stood with his head down and his hands folded behind his back, and he did not react emotionally. We will end here on this episode. Next episode, we will be covering the trial of Parnell and Murphy in the kidnapping of Stephen Steiner. For this episode's cold case, it is a double homicide in Ukiah, California, and the information came from the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office and the Ukiah Daily Journal. On Monday, November 1st, 2004, Mendocino County Sheriffs arrived at the 900 block of Orr Springs and found 66-year-old Charles Mitchell beaten to death outside his home. Inside the home, his son, 34-year-old Nolan Mitchell, was also deceased from being shot in his bed. The Sheriff's Department has spent several years investigating this case and report that they do not have a suspect, motive, or ideas about why the two men were targeted. Both Charles and his son lived alone in the home. They were also both members of the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Charles was a retired mill worker who had just announced his intention to run for tribal chief of the Coyote Valley Board of Pomo Indians. Nolan graduated from Ukiah High School in 1983 and was very proud of his time on the football team at Mendocino College. He worked at the Hopland Shokawa Casino as a drop supervisor. If you have any information on the murder of Charles Mitchell or Nolan Mitchell, please call the Mendocino Sheriff's tip line at 707-234-2100. Thank you for listening to another episode of California True Crime. You can see us on all your favorite social media at Cali True Crime. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. You can email us at calitruecrime at gmail.com. As always, we'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Duncan, Melanie. This has been a production of Chateau Walnut. Chateau Walnut.